Well, a good morning to you all. Let's see if we can get this to work. And it's on and I'm pressing the button. Hooray! A quick quiz for you. What is the one word that connects these objects? An onion, um, Russian dolls, Vianetta, hens, and the Book of Ruth. I'm not going to give you very long. The answer is layers. So obviously, some of you know me too well and know how my mind works, Phil. I'm sorry for you that I've impacted you so much. The, the hens is a little bit of a, um, a, uh, an additional one, a play on words. I've been working um, on the bird flu outbreak for the nine months and, and poultry keeps coming into my mind, whatever I'm doing. Um, but the rest of those objects have layers. They're built upon layers. You remove one layer and you find another layer underneath. And the book of Ruth, as we've been going through it, is like that. You read something on the surface and you understand it. But if you dig deeper, there's additional meaning, additional layers. And we're going to see some more of that this morning as we look at the last chapter in Ruth, Ruth chapter 4. So I've got it up on the screen, um, and if you've got a, uh, a Bible with you or device, please feel free to, um, to look up Ruth and chapter 4, and it says this, Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat down there, just as the kinsman redeemer he had mentioned came along. Boaz said, Come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, sit here, and they did so. Then he said to the kinsman redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggested that you should buy it in the presence of these seated here and the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me, so I will know, for no one has the right to do it except you, and I am the next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, on the day that you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead man with his property. At this, the kinsman redeemer said, Then I cannot redeem it, because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself, I cannot do it. Now in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and the transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the kinsman redeemer said to Boaz, Buy it yourself, and he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are my witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilon, and Mahon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Mahon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from amongst his family or from his hometown. Today you are witnesses. Then the elders and all the people at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Neymar bore to Judah. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise the Lord, who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better than you to, than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. 
So the book of Ruth, which we have been studying and we've almost come to the end of, is the eighth book in the Old Testament, starting with Genesis, where God says to Abraham, you are going to be the father of many nations. I'm going to give you land. I'm going to give you blessings. You will be my people and I will be your God. And this promise, this covenant promise, is then repeated to Isaac and to Jacob. Jacob was uh, married to Leah and Rachel, and he had 12 sons, Leah and Rachel, mentioned in the passage today. 12 sons who became the tribes of Israel. Amongst them was Joseph. Joseph was, was sold into slavery in Egypt by his brothers, but by the Lord's blessing became a man who was powerful. And in a time of famine, Jacob and the family all came to Egypt. And we find the end of Genesis the family of Jacob, who's now been renamed Israel, in Egypt. And God blesses them and they multiply. And the Egyptians um, make them slaves. And in the book of Exodus, we see God rescuing them, redeeming them from Egypt, out to this promised land that he promised Abraham. Um, and we see um, the people who then disobey and start worshipping idols, and they're in the wilderness for 40 years. And in the book of Leviticus, we have um, a, a telling of some of the law to the Levites, the priests, on how to worship and how to live. It um, gives them guidance, but also describes some of the characteristics of God. In Numbers, we have details of those who came out of Egypt and are heading towards the promised land. Deuteronomy is a retelling of the law. Then we have Joshua, who is the man who is called upon by God to bring the Israelites into the promised land where they inherit this land that God has promised. It's divided up into the tribes, into family um, groups. And then God speaks and, and sends judges into the land and talks to the Israelites who sometimes agree and do as they say, and sometimes disobey. Um, and in, the, in this context, we have this story of Ruth and Naomi. And following Ruth, we have the last judge who is Samuel, who anoints the first king. And then we go on in the, in the Old Testament with, um, with kings and chronicles, which details the years of Israel under kingly rule where there is decline and division. So in this narrative of the nation of Israel, of nations of Egypt and others, of important people, of patriarchs, of kings, of judges, we also have this, this story of individuals, of an unimportant family. And what it tells us is that God isn't just interested in nations and the importance people, but is interested in individuals, individuals like you and me. Also, this book of Ruth is a metaphor of God's grace-filled plan for the future, future blessing and fruitfulness. It's a book that's so important that we understand what it's all about. In my last preach, I, I mentioned <clears throat> taking note when a, a writer of, of scripture has repeated a word um, many times in the Bible passage. And in this chapter four, we have the word redeem um, appears uh, 11 times. It's not a, a commonly used word in our language. It, the word redeem means rescue or to buy back. So we might find it being used if you're watching um, a, a sporting competition and uh, the commentator or pundit might say that the player had a very bad first half or first set, but they redeemed themselves in the second, which means that they earned back, they rescued their reputation. The other way we might use this word um, is you might see it um, if you were to use um, one of the shops, a pawn shop, or uh, one of the, the shops where you take a valuable and they convert it into cash for you. So you take um, your great-grandmother's wedding ring and you give it to them. And if you read their terms and conditions, it says this, when you are ready to redeem, 
simply pay back the loan and interest and your valuables will be returned. So it's again a meaning of buying back. The book of Ruth is a story of Naomi whose husbands and sons both die. She and her daughter Ruth, who is from Moab, return to Bethlehem. No husband, no children, to no descendants to support them. They are both penniless and they have no hope of saving themselves. The land that was part of the family is God's promised land. The land that belongs to Israelites. The land that was divided between the tribes and divided into family when they entered the promised land. It's God's kingdom. And God has put in place a process to preserve it for the Israelite nation. To save it for the nation, save it for the tribe, save it for the family, and to save it for the individual. In Leviticus 25, it says this, If one of your fellow Israelites becomes poor and sells some of their property, their nearest relative is to come and redeem, to buy back what they have sold. So here we have the guardian or kinsman redeemer, kinsman being a, a close relative, a redeemer, a person who buys back, who rescues what was lost. And in that context, they're talking about property, but it could be a wider context of reputation, rescuing and buying back the name. It would be like somebody going into that pawn shop and purchasing back great granny's wedding ring and then giving it to you without you having the need to buying it back. The kinsman redeemer had to be a relative. They had to be willing to pay and they had to be able to pay the price in full. Boaz, who we've come to uh, know and love over these last few weeks, he filled these criteria. Naomi and Ruth were desperate and destitute. They could not save themselves. And this past situation in Bethlehem reflects us here and now. See, the Bible tells us back in Genesis that we were made to be in a relationship with God. And that we've all done wrong things. The Bible calls it sin. And that the cost of this sin is death. Both a spiritual death, as being separated from God, and a physical death. But the good news is that we can be rescued. We can be bought back. The payment of death has been met by Jesus. And this is a free gift it's not by anything we can do, not by works, because we are hopeless and destitute. Jesus met the criteria. He became a man, fully human. To be our kinsman redeemer, he needed to be fully human. He also needed to be willing. Jesus said, I lay down my life on my own accord. And he was able to pay the full price once and for all. Jesus said, no man comes to the Father but by me. Our relationship with Father God can be rescued, restored through Jesus. Boaz not only brought back the land, but he provided a son an heir to ensure that the family name continued. Now this is really important back in biblical times. Names were hugely important. We see God changing people's names as their character and their situation changed. We saw earlier in the book of Ruth, Naomi, when she came back to Bethlehem, said that she should be called Mara or Bitter changing her name because it described that she felt empty. We read in our passage today, in verse 5, Boaz emphasizes maintaining the name of the dead with his property. Verse 10, maintain the name. 
the name will not disappear. And in verse 17 at the end, we see Ruth has a child and his name is recorded. Ruth has a son called Obed. Contrast this to a fellow who we met at the beginning of this chapter. We may have missed him. He was the closest relative to Ruth and Naomi. Boaz mentioned him at the end of chapter 3. He was the person whose right it was to be the kinsman redeemer, and he was the person who declined that offer. In our Bibles, Boaz refers to him as my friend. The act in the, the language it was written, his name is in there as Mr. What's his name? His name is not recorded. And that's hugely significant. The man who declined to be the kinsman redeemer, with his name has been lost in history. But Naomi, Ruth, Boaz, Obed, and following on as we'll see next week, names in history because names are important. The book of Revelation talks about the people of God, Christians, having their names written in the Lamb's book of life. Our redeemed name is there forever. Our redeemed name means that we have an eternal future of fruitfulness and blessing. And for those that don't, Revelation says this, if any of anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. When you think about what a kinsman redeemer does, it's all about what is lost being brought back or rescued. Without Jesus, we are desperate. We are helpless and empty. We cannot rescue ourselves. Naomi and Ruth were redeemed. They got back what was lost and they saw the fruit of new birth. A son was born. For us, Jesus restores what was lost. We have a restored relationship with God. We receive blessings and fruitfulness. Jesus gives us a new identity in Christ and our name is written into the book of life. And the beautiful thing is, we don't need to worry about needing to be redeemed again. He paid the price of redemption once and for all. And I guess the obvious question for me this morning is, is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? If something were to happen to you this very day, is your name there? Do you know that you are insured of fruitfulness and blessing for eternity? Have you accepted the rescue and redemption that Jesus has offered for you? If you haven't this morning, we would love to share more with you. Come up and see Ollie or myself afterwards. The fruitfulness of marriage. Verse 13 says this, So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. Seems just a fairly innocuous phrase. Oh, Boaz and Ruth got, got married. That's lovely. And we can easily pass on and move to the next stage of the chapter. David last week was absolutely correct when he suggested that Boaz, as kinsman redeemer, could have married Naomi. However, Naomi is thought to be about 80 years old and past childbearing age, so for the significance of what marriage was for, of, of producing heirs, um, it, culturally they wouldn't have got married. But Ruth was of childbearing age. If Moaz had married Naomi, I don't think we would have had this book in our Bible, which seems possibly an odd statement to make, but this is why. Boaz married Ruth. 
significant layers. On the surface, oh, that's lovely. Dig deeper, there's more meaning to this. Just remember who Ruth was. Ruth was a Moabite. She was not one of the children of Israel. She was a foreigner. In the New Testament, they call them Gentiles. We would say they were a non-Christian. But Ruth had accepted the God of Israel as her own. You see, marriage is a theme throughout the Bible as a picture of God's relationship with us, with Christians, with his people. The theologian Jeffrey Brimley says this in his book, As God made man in his own image, so he made earthly marriage in the image of his own eternal marriage with his people. I am your God and you are my people is a marriage type covenant promise that we saw in Genesis. Jeremiah calls God the husband of Israel. We looked back um, a while ago in our series on the minor prophets in the book of Hosea. And the book of Hosea, the uh, Song of Songs, are, are both books that show the love of God through the metaphor of marriage. The other end of our Bible, Revelation, talks about eternity as a wedding banquet with God's people are the bride and Christ is the husband. Boaz, in the book of Ruth, is presenting us with a prophetic picture of Jesus. If we look at the narrative of the Old Testament, this is the first clear indication that God's plan of rescue, of redemption, is not just for the nation of Israel. But his plan is bigger than that. It's for the whole world. And I'm sure we are all living in the blessing of this. I don't know all of our ancestry, but quite likely most of us are not from a Jewish background. We are part of the family of God because of the breadth of his grace, that we are part of the whole world that Jesus died for and are welcomed into his blessing. Since we have benefited from this wider inclusion, there are challenges for us to make sure in our mission that we have hearts that are like God's, not narrowed and confined in our witness of God's redeeming mercy, but blessing to all, to people who look like us and people who don't look like us, who are culturally the same to us, but culturally different to us. We are called to be a blessing to them and to share the good news of God's fruitfulness and rescue. Bearing fruit in our character. I just want to hasten to add at this point that I had written this section about a month ago before the events of this week. So um, the fact that there is a strong link with what's been happening um, in politics and some of the, uh, the major points that I'm bringing out about character, um, I think is, is more God's working than anything insightful on my, my part. The Bible tells us that as we become Christians, the Holy Spirit works in us and we have the fruit of the Holy Spirit working with our determination to become more like Jesus. We are called to become Christ-like. And since we've seen that Boaz is a type of Christ, and I think we can look at Boaz and become Boaz-like as well. There are a number of films that you can watch of where we will find the main character, and on this uh, particular example, James Bond is the main character who's ultimate purpose is a good one but in the process of achieving the ultimate purpose they just go wayward they stop talking to their friends they become isolated they start disobeying the rules and regulations and it makes their ultimate purpose more difficult their process of 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 
trying to get to what they do is, is damaging, damaging to themselves and damaging to their ultimate goal. This is not like Boaz. Throughout the book of Ruth, we see Boaz as a gentleman, someone who's kind and considerate. Consider how he greets his workers and how they greeted him in chapter 2. Consider how he puts Ruth's need before his own. He is a humble man, yet he's a bold man and not afraid to act with purpose. We see that Boaz is open and transparent. He's also a man who's accountable. He is a man of integrity, which is the word of the week at the moment, I think. I think we can infer from what we saw last week in chapter 3, the interaction between him and himself, uh, him and Ruth on the threshing floor, that he quite likes Ruth. I think he, was, it, he invested and certainly quite, he would like to, to, to marry Ruth and to have a future together. I don't know about you, but when I am invested in an outcome, the temptation not to act with integrity can increase because there's a risk of not getting the outcome. I think that could be something that we can all find, that when we're invested in something, our temptation to maybe not be quite someone of integrity can become something that we had to deal with. But Boaz is a man of integrity. He tells Ruth, there's a closer relative. He should be your kinsman redeemer. His actions aren't hidden. His actions are open and public for all to see because Boaz has nothing to hide. He's not going behind their back and marrying Ruth and then going, oops, I forgot of you. You're the closer relative. You should be the first. No, he was open. He allowed that risk that he wouldn't marry Ruth because he knew what the right thing to do was. He follows tradition. He conducts his business at the city gate where it's open, where it's official. He invites the ten elders of the city to join him as witnesses. But they're not only witnesses as city leaders. They were also spiritual authorities. So they had the authority to step in and correct Boaz if he got out of line. Boaz was humble enough that he was willing to submit himself to the wise counsel of his elders. The word integrity means having the quality of being honest, strong moral principles, and moral uprightness. And the importance of integrity cannot be overemphasized, as we have seen in Westminster this week. Jesus spoke about how people speak and how they should speak with integrity. That they would use language in those days whose meaning was loose and open to interpretation. And that, as we have seen in recent weeks and months, is no different today. Consider how people have used the word work events and work functions, when in fact party may have been a more appropriate word to use. Jesus said in caution, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Speak with honesty and integrity. Act with honesty and integrity. We all need to be like Boaz, open, transparent, accountable behaving and speaking with integrity. This will bring fruitfulness to our lives and will be a powerful witness and affect others. I know I have benefited at work with a previous line manager when I have done something and then come to her and said, I'm telling you this because I am making myself accountable to you. Actually, I have seen the fruitfulness as I have then been provided um, with more responsibility. I have seen a fruitful, and I'm sure that it has given witness to her of a, me being a man of integrity and standing up and acting 
as I profess uh, in my belief as a Christian. And we all need to seek this way, to act this way, and to talk this way in our relationships at home and at work, with our finances, with every relationship we have, and with our brothers and sisters and leaders and others at church. We need to be accountable to others within our Christian family, ready to listen to the wise counsel of others. We've recently had a sermon series of Paul's letters to the church at Philippi, and a key theme in that was unity. Acting with integrity within our church family is key to church unity. And this especially can be important during a time of transition, as we're going through at the moment. I think it's key to, to delve into that one. So I've got a ch challenge here to the senior leadership. Learn from the events that we have seen this week at Westminster and be men of integrity. When you're stood up here publicly, but in your lives as you lead through and live, be men who are known for having integrity. When there's a change that you feel we ought to be making, but you think this is going to be not necessarily met with a, uh, with a, 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 you know, a popular um, opinion. Don't be tempted to surreptitiously move it in and get it integrated into what we do. But be open about it. Say what you want to do and why you feel God's leading us in that way. So, for instance, if you wanted us to start singing Gregorian chants in our worship. Now, I feel this is a safe um, example to use because I don't believe we're going that way. Say that's what we're going to do and why you think is the right thing to do. And the challenge for us is to be accountable, ready to listen, wise counsel of our, of our leaders and be people of integrity. Let our yes be yes. Don't stand there and say, yes, we believe in our senior leadership team. They're fantastic, they're great. And then we just don't bother turning up because we don't want to sing in Gregorian chants. Let's follow actions with support. Let our no, no be no. What would be wrong is if we've suddenly found that there's Gregorian chants being going on, and then I phone up Steve and say, Steve, what are these Muppets in the uh, senior leadership team up to? Emma and I were having a discussion at home. Ellen joined it. My goodness, you'd have heard what Ellen said about it. her thoughts. My goodness, I, I understand Sean doesn't think it's a good idea either. Do you know if there are others? Actually, uh, what we should do is, if our knows no, that come and say, Holly, I don't think this is the right thing to do. So if we foster support of others and start talking amongst ourselves, we can create disunity. And by the time we come and talk to the senior leadership team, our voice may be the voice that the senior leadership team need to hear. But if we've caused disunity and they've already heard of disquiet, it can be very difficult to accept that voice. So let's be people whose yes is yes. And I know be no in the way we act and the way we speak. So as we come to a conclusion, Naomi left Bethlehem in a time of famine. She returned in a time of fruitful harvest. But as she returned to Bethlehem, she felt empty. But as we've come to the end, or towards the end, of the book of Ruth, there is now a new birth, there is a child, there is fruitfulness. Redemption has led to fruitfulness, to property, to harvest. Ruth has a child and there is future hope. We, like Ruth and Naomi, are hopeless and can't save ourselves. But Jesus had paid the price for us to be back in relationship with God. He has given us life and he has given us life 
in abundance. We have benefited from the breadth of God's grace and we need to reflect this in our mission to others. And we have an example of God's character in Boaz. Open, accountable, loving, honourable and a man of integrity. Let us, as the Holy Spirit changes us and helps us to bear fruit, be people that our character is like Boaz, who foreshadows Christ, who are a blessing to each other and an encouragement to others, both here and out in the world. Amen.